Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Will he apologize? Why did he not recuse himself? It's called hiding. The finance minister takes a grilling over his personal assets. The founder of Montreal's world-famous comedy festival resigns over allegations of sexual misconduct. Accommodation or intimidation? We will not even have the right to go out. I'm sure of it. The backlash over Quebec's new law. Sunny ways, my friends. Sunny ways. Exactly two years after that historic night, that issue takes your questions about the Prime Minister and how he and his Liberal government are faring. There is the letter of the law, and then there are optics. The finance minister has learned that the hard way. So today, Bill Morneau said he will place all of his assets into a blind trust, even though the ethics commissioner told him two years ago that wasn't necessary. And as David Cochran explains, it may not quiet the outrage. It's an unusual political scandal. The minister follows ethics guidelines to the letter, but still pays a heavy price. What we've seen over the last week is that I need to do more. As a minister of finance in this role, it's important to make sure people have absolute confidence. Doing more means selling the shares he owns in his former company, Morneau Chappelle, and putting everything else in a blind trust, something the ethics commissioner advised him just last year wasn't necessary. A blind trust agreement is not required. The best measure of compliance would be to establish a conflict of interest screen. I perhaps naively uh, thought that, you know, in Canada, following the rules and respecting the recommendations of the ethics commissioner, respecting the recommendations of an officer of parliament, would be what Canadians would expect. But that's ethics. This is politics. Why does he expect us to blindly trust that he is not hiding other conflicts of interest? We all thought he had placed his shares in a blind trust. Each attack elicited a version of the same answer. I worked with the ethics commissioner to make sure that she understood my situation. I took her recommendations and made sure that I moved forward with them to not have a conflict of interest. Now I've gone one step further. And, and each answer elicited more outrage. That, I think, will give a great deal of confidence to all Canadians. The NDP drew a straight line from Morneau's job to Morneau's bank account. Proposed pension legislation that could have boosted the share value of Morneau Chappelle, which manages pensions. But how does pocketing millions of dollars from his work as the minister do anything but serve himself? Yeah. What the member opposite knows is that I fully disclosed my assets to the Ethics Commissioner. I worked with the Ethics Commissioner to get her recommendations, and I followed those recommendations. Today's move comes after a week of retreats by Morneau on his controversial package of tax reforms. He's tweaked some and scrapped others due to loud protests, a significant public policy decision that's been largely overshadowed by the politics of his personal wealth. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Bill Morneau is just one topic at issue we'll dig into. There are answers to your questions coming up a little later. Quebec's newest law is getting a lot of attention right across the country. It bans people wearing face coverings from giving or receiving public services, everything from health care to riding a bus. It's elicited criticism from the Prime Minister, even the entire Ontario legislature. And tonight there are questions being raised about the law's constitutionality. Hannah Thibodeau has more. Zeynab Benusht was at the mall when a clerk told her she couldn't shop there with her niqab on. She said, uh, we, you don't have the right to be here, I'm going to call security and you have to take this, uh, your, like, your veal off if you want to go in the store. Benusht says it was the first time she'd been refused service, but fears it's going to happen more often. Now that Quebec passed a law banning face coverings for anyone using government services, including public transit, libraries and hospitals. They're going to try to apply this law to every single thing, so we will not even have the right to go out. I'm sure of it. The law passed yesterday, but the debate over it intensified today. Premier. 
In an unprecedented move, all political parties in the Ontario legislature condemn the Quebec law. Banning women from wearing a niqab when they pick up a book from the library will only divide us. All Canadians have a legal right to their religious beliefs. This is a dangerous law that compromises rather than protects public safety. Montreal's mayor says he won't direct municipal staff to enforce the face covering ban. Do we want to create the kneecap police? Do we want to put all that pressure uh, uh, under the, uh, you know, the, the drivers or the librarian or anybody who's providing some services? This constitutional lawyer says there's a charter challenge looming. As soon as they try to deny people services that are generally available for other people on the grounds that they're wearing something, they're on shaky grounds. The Prime Minister says he doesn't agree with the law, but his government won't challenge it. I think we have to respect that uh, this is a debate that's ongoing in society and we respect uh, that uh, the National Assembly in Quebec has uh, taken a position on this. In our opinion, it's, it's still compatible with charters. I think we are at the limit of what our laws and charters uh, would, would allow. Many believe this was a poorly conceived law and will eventually be overturned in the courts and that the Quebec Liberals created it to stop support sliding from them to the Coalition Avenir Quebec, a party that takes a much stronger stand against the public display of religious symbols. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Some high-profile Quebecers are facing allegations tonight, among them Gilbert Rozon, a powerful figure in Quebec's arts community and the founder of the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. The accusations come from multiple people and span three decades. Alison Northcott reports. For years, Gilbert Rozon headed the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival, a huge event for Montreal every summer that's known around the world. But this week, at least 10 women have come forward with disturbing allegations against Rozon, including sexual assault and sexual harassment. Actress Patricia Tulan is one of them. Il pousse la porte, rentre dans l'appartement, et la première chose que je me souviens, c'est qu'il me plaque au mur, qu'il m'embrasse, qu'il enlève ma robe. Tulane says that happened in 1994. She says she felt ashamed for years and never went to police, so there was no investigation, and the allegations have not been tested in court. C'était un homme très puissant. He was a powerful man, she says. I was starting my career. I was young. Rosan declined to comment, but as other allegations began to surface last night, he announced he was stepping down as president of Just for Laughs and as commissioner of Montreal's 375th anniversary celebrations. Shaken by the allegations concerning me, I wish to devote all my time to step back and take stock. To all those whom I may have offended throughout my life, I am sincerely sorry, he wrote. In 1998, Rosan pleaded guilty to sexual assault and received an unconditional discharge. His influence continued to grow. In France, he was a judge on this popular talent show, which the network has pulled off the air for now. Rosan is a major figure in Quebec, with influence in the province's cultural circles. Circles already shaken this week by allegations of sexual misconduct by other well-known Quebec media personalities, including variety show host Eric Salvay. Right now, everybody's talking about that everywhere. I guess the same way Hollywood and, and America is talking about Weinstein. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid that their name is going to pop up. That's what I've heard. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called this a moment of awakening and says mindsets are changing. It doesn't matter how much power you have, how much influence you have, it's never all right. And I think people are beginning to act on it finally. Tulan says she spoke out after hearing other women's stories and wanted to add her voice to many others demanding change. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. RCMP in Fernie, B.C. are still trying to figure out what caused a fatal ammonia leak at a hockey arena on Tuesday. Late last night, the bodies of the three men were removed from the facility. Investigators are still trying to get a better understanding of what went wrong. Tomorrow, all city operations will shut down so the community can mourn. With an increasing number of Canadians being prescribed medical marijuana, there's been an unexpected consequence for users. Longer waits to get through airport security. Current rules mean police have to be called every time someone with medical pot is screened. But as Alison Crawford tells us, that's about to change. 
Chris Noseworthy prepares for an early morning flight to Calgary. It's been a very unpleasant experience just in general as a whole. Um, Up until now, traveling with his prescription pot has been a major source of anxiety. Airport screeners had to call police to verify prescription paperwork for every passenger traveling with medical marijuana. I've been surrounded by a dozen police officers all at the ready because they thought I was going to, I don't know, being threatened. And it's just, I've had nervous breakdowns, I've had anxiety attacks going through security. Noseworthy filed complaints with Canada's Air Transport Security Authority, CATSA, and a human rights complaint. Others did too. Meanwhile, the number of Canadians travelling with medical marijuana has exploded. Five years ago, CATSA security screeners only had cause to call the cops to verify documents 128 times. Yet, in the first six months of this year, CATSA summoned the police 2,900 times. So CATSA has decided to stop calling the cops. There was a, a huge increase and uh, calling the police every time uh, was cumbersome. It took time and some passengers uh, rightfully felt, uh, felt that it wasn't necessary to call the police when they were uh, in, in possession of a legitimate certificate or, or documentation. Police assigned to Toronto's Pearson Airport have already noticed a difference. With the new policy change and the decrease of calls for service to the police, to Peel Regional Police, it allows for our officers to increase proactive patrol and, and work on making the whole airport grounds a safer place for travel. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. <laughs> Feeling less dread, Noseworthy heads into the terminal to put the new policy to the test. And for the first time in more than four years, he sails through security. Katz's new policy will remain in effect until next July when pot becomes legal. That said, marijuana remains illegal in most other countries and if traveling internationally, airport security at the other end may not be as understanding. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. Coming up. This 1984 plane crash left 14 children without a mother. The smaller ones don't know what their mother was like. Why she would be very proud of her kids. And later... My name is Don Newman. An old friend brings his perspective to 40 years of TV cameras in the House of Commons. The U.S. president is hearing criticism from an unlikely source, his Republican predecessor. George W. Bush didn't mention Donald Trump by name, but today he said this. We've seen nationalism distorted into nativism. We've forgotten the dynamism that immigration has always brought to America. Bullying and prejudice in our public life sets a national tone, provides permission for cruelty and bigotry. Bush made the comments during a speech in New York. As for President Trump, today he met with the governor of Puerto Rico. It's been a month since Hurricane Maria devastated the American territory, and despite Trump's self-congratulatory assessment of the relief effort, for many, it's like the storm just hit. About 80% of the island is still without power. Many still don't have fresh water, and desperation is leaving thousands to just pack up and leave. Stephen D'Souza has more. From the safety of her brother's store in the Bronx, Ilona Acevedo shows him the devastation Hurricane Maria unleashed on their neighborhood in Puerto Rico. I'm glad because I'm here with my family, but my heart is in Puerto Rico with my other family. Acevedo managed to get out last week to attend a family wedding in New York. At the airport, she saw many making the difficult choice to leave their home behind for good. Very sad because the families, they need to pick up and move, even though they don't want to leave the country. There are already more than 700,000 Puerto Ricans living here in New York City. And officials say, as a result of the hurricane, tens of thousands more could be on their way. Social service agencies are preparing for the waves of American citizens who are now essentially forced to live as refugees. We tend to think of migration as something that happens only across borders, and the reality is that the history of the United States have lots of, has lots of waves of migration. The slow pace of relief efforts is spurring the decision to leave for many. Did we do a great job? You responded immediately, sir. And, and you... The president put Puerto Rico's governor on the spot today and sounded triumphant as he praised the hurricane response. 
I give ourselves a 10. I look at the stupidity of it. I mean, you know, he's a man child, so. Richard Colon is a legendary breakdancer and hip hop star who carries a lot of weight in New York's Puerto Rican community. He's raised close to $100,000, and through his sponsors, he helped get 600 water filtration systems to the island. What's the difference? He says Puerto Ricans have to rely on each other, not Trump. If I focus on him, I'm not going to get anything done. So I operate as if FEMA doesn't exist, nor the U.S. government. Ilona Acevedo agrees. We are going to rise with or without his help. For now, she plans to go back and help rebuild. But long term, she's not sure if she'll stay or join the thousands expected to leave the island forever. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. The Spanish government says it will suspend Catalonia's autonomy this weekend. By invoking a vague constitutional rule, Spain could replace the regional government and take control of the police and finances. Catalonia's president is threatening to declare independence if Spain doesn't agree to talks. Eager shoppers lined up outside Sears stores today as the company began its liquidation sales. But customers who have already made big purchases from the chain and bought an extended warranty are out of luck. The company has stopped honoring those agreements. Jacqueline Hansen has more. For shoppers eager to get the first pick of Sears liquidation sales. I just have to be looking for a new dishwasher, so I figured this is a good chance to get a deal on one. No extended warranties warranties isn't a problem. No, no, I never buy extended warranties. (laughs) Usually, neither does Karen Dwyer. But when she replaced all her appliances at Sears last year, she did buy them. Because, she says, the retailer offered her a deal. If she bought a three-year extended warranty and didn't use it, she would get her money back on a gift card. Now that the company is closing, the warranty is gone and the deal is off. I'm sort of bitter towards Sears. Dwyer spent Uh, nearly $6,000 on her fridge, dishwasher and stove and nearly $800 on the extended warranties. $800 is a lot of money. Extended warranties generally aren't based on the likelihood of the products failing. Research shows they're typically based on the product price about 10 to 20 percent of it. Businesses sell extended warranties because of the money. This professor has been doing research on these types of warranties for nearly a decade. Retailers give people a discount on the basic product to get a huge markup on the extended warranty. He says consumers buy the extra warranties for different reasons, from peace of mind to pressure from salespeople. Or maybe you have a recall. This personal finance expert says in most cases, that extra coverage isn't necessary. Well, what many many Canadians don't realize is that many credit cards offer a buyer protection plan, which acts as an extended warranty. So after your manufacturer warranty is ended, many of these plans kick in to give you an additional one, maybe two years of protection. So some Sears warranty holders could still have other options, even as the pricey coverage they paid for disappears along with the company. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Straight ahead, the flawed testing that left a trail of broken families. Now the Fifth Estate reveals how the Mother Risk program could have and should have been stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, our very own Tragically Hip. The hip have blues in their blood, rock in their soul. The guys burst onto the scene from Kingston. Their early videos identified closely with that city. Swim. Now, well, their debut album with MCA identifies with the states. Lots of references to bayous and American cities. This song was written by lead singer Gord Downey three years ago in Kingston. But the music, in fact, the entire new album was recorded in Memphis. Why Memphis? And the music history and the culture is definitely the cornerstone, you know, of, of Memphis. And it hangs very low in the air and you can really feel it. So there is a definite feel in Memphis, a feel that was an advantage for your recording. I don't know if if we could put it into words. It was, you know, it's that southern 
drawl, sort of lazy music. You guys thing. were relaxed, obviously. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's important, isn't it? Yep. Saw a little cloud and looked a little like me. So after playing to rave reviews and sold out houses in Canada, is Tragically Hip putting Canada in the past as it tries to capture the U.S.? Was there a conscious effort to go to the States and identify with the States and get more fans in the States? Everyone knows that, that I mean, you can do as well as you want in Canada, but you're not really legitimate until, until you've done well in, in the United States. After the hip sold-out appearance at Toronto's Concert Hall, they're off to the Maritimes, and you guessed it, a major tour of the States. Health officials have widened their investigation into an outbreak of salmonella linked to frozen bread breaded chicken. Since June, 18 people in six provinces have become sick. One of those people died, but it's not determined if salmonella contributed to their death. And two more products are being recalled due to possible contamination. Jane's Pub Style Chicken Burgers and Jane's Pub Style Snacks Popcorn Chicken. There's more information on our website. It was touted as a simple test that could keep children safe. Parents in child protection cases would submit a hair sample and a child wellness organization called Mother Risk would test it for drug or alcohol abuse. After 35,000 tests and thousands of families ripped apart, the test was deemed unreliable. Now, a joint CBC Toronto Star investigation has revealed that authorities could have come to that conclusion decades earlier. Mark Kelly reports. Tammy Whiteman's life revolved around her two daughters, but with their home life marred by turmoil, the girls were removed from her by Children's Aid in 2008. When Tammy felt she'd turned her life around, she sought to regain custody of the girls. The court required her to take a hair test from the lab, Mother Risk. She took four tests. All four were between two times to four times the top levels of a daily chronic abuser of alcohol. How much alcohol were you drinking at that point in your life? None. Turns out Tammy wasn't the only parent questioning the test results from Mother Risk. After a criminal conviction was overturned because of flawed test results produced by the lab in 2014, the Ontario government ordered an investigation and the findings were explosive. These results are inadequate and unreliable and no forensic lab in the world conducted tests and interpreted those tests in this manner. Nowhere. By the time Lang's report landed, the lab had conducted more than 35,000 tests for parents in five provinces, in some cases tearing those families apart. The decision's irreversible. But our investigation has uncovered a case that should have stopped this tragedy in its tracks. Back in 1993, in a pretrial hearing in a grisly murder case in Colorado, Mother Risk presented hair test evidence to help the accused avoid the death penalty. The state prosecutor, Eva Wilson, felt the tests were flawed. They were coming in as scientific experts trying to say, this is what we know and this is how we know it. And they were not using um, scientifically accepted uh, procedures. She was right. The evidence presented by the Mother Risk Lab was deemed unreliable and ruled inadmissible. It would take 22 years for a Canadian judge to reach the same conclusion. And by then, the damage was done. As for Tammy Whiteman, she finally figured out why her hair test results claimed she was an alcoholic. She used a lot of hairspray. It's 70% alcohol. She got her girls back. The Ontario government set up a commission to review the more recent cases where children were permanently removed from their families due in large part to the hair tests. But so far, they've only managed to reconnect some six families. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. Tomorrow night on the Fifth Estate, Mark has stories of parents from across Canada whose families were shattered by these unreliable tests. That's at 9 local time on CBC or at cbc.ca slash fifth. Exactly two years ago, Justin Trudeau's Liberals won the federal election and tonight is at issue night. Andrew, Althea and Paul Wells will take your questions, the hits, the misses, and what's in play for the second half of the government's mandate? That's next on The National. 
Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX gained 35 points. The dollar increased slightly. In New York, the Dow edged up 5 points and the price of oil decreased 75 cents a barrel. Canadian scientists and their counterparts on the Soviet side of the North Pole have found out that the Arctic ice pack is slowly melting. The ocean is warming up, its coat of ice is now only about 60% as thick as it was at the turn of the century. Polar ice will melt and by the end of the century this will bring floods to low-lying coastal areas. Inland there will be drought and in other places an increase in storms. Some crops could be devastated. But looking at the brighter side of things, at least our great-grandchildren should have warmer winters. Just a sample of the broad spectrum of opinion on the changes taking place in our atmosphere. Cataclysmic. Uh, not a trivial matter and not one to, to be taken lightly. The greenhouse effect will wreak total havoc on the natural world. All of them are burning fossil fuels. All of them are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But if I put in too much carbon dioxide, in effect, what I'm doing is putting a dome over the entire world. The temperature begins to rise because it's being trapped, the greenhouse effect. And we can actually see it here on the thermometer just from these, these ordinary studio lights. Compounding the problem has been the systematic depletion of the world's forests. Trees need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. As the number of trees diminish worldwide, more carbon dioxide is left to build up in the atmosphere. The start of global warming can also mean extreme and erratic weather, and the evidence has been mounting up. Knowing what we know now, how serious it may get, I don't want to see us looking back saying, oh, we could have done this, we could have done this, but now it's too late. I think what concerns me most about global warming, I feel like we're just in a little experiment and that we're just not leaving anything for the future generations. A piece of film was supposed to have been cut to open this year's Festival of Festivals, but the organizers couldn't find any, so an old-fashioned ribbon was used instead. This evening, the gala premiere belongs to a Canadian film, Ticket to Heaven. A number of limousines have pulled up with well-dressed people, and fortunately, nobody seems to know who they are. Despite the problems, after the film, it was party time, and there was everything you'd expect at a showbiz bash. Stars, booze, good-looking women, good-looking men, people dancing to the music of Martha and the Muffins, and more booze. It's warm beady night at the Festival of Festivals, where the spotlight shines on everyone. The ushers at the theater had their hands full, it was their job to make sure the fans and the stars didn't collide. But when the big black Continental pulled up to the curb, there was no stopping the autograph hounds. I'm very proud of myself from restraining myself from attempting to wrestle him to the ground because it's exactly what I wanted to do. This was opening night, a gala for the North American premiere of Joshua Then and Now. There were Klieg lights and limousines, but there were also some charming down-home touches. The star, James Woods, arrived with his proud parents, who came in from Rhode Island for the event. Now, the oh-so-cool set have decreed Canada's little festival that could a must. <laughs> that, of course, is Robin Williams, Claudia Schiffer. It's the only film festival in the world where you see all of the most important films. You see a whole year come in advance. As un-Canadian as it is to gloat, movie critic Roger Ebert says go right ahead. Yeah, it's okay, Canada. It's okay. It's a real big, real good festival. Exactly two years ago today, Canadians decided Justin Trudeau would be the next Prime Minister. We've been gathering your questions for at issue about how Trudeau and his Liberal government are doing so far. But first, let's take a quick look back at a historic night. The Liberal Party has completed a stunning turnaround, going from third place and 34 seats in the last Parliament 
to power. Justin Trudeau will be your next prime minister. Prime Minister Trudeau. Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. This is what positive politics can do. At issue and their sunny ways are here. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto and joining us from Ottawa tonight, Althea Raj and Paul Wells. So we're going to get you to answer questions that we've been collecting from viewers all week. We'll come back in just a sec. Uh, there were two about the big news of the day. Finance Minister Bill Morneau's handling of proposed tax changes and his own personal finances. Andre Rachowski asks, after the revelation that his French villa is held by a corporation, does Bill Morneau have any legitimacy left to carry out any tax reform? And someone named TFT on Twitter asks, Electoral and tax reform consult over the summer, then ham-fisted house reform attempts. What happened to open and transparent government? A couple of answers in a moment, but a bit of background first. Morneau has been accused of not being clear about his assets, that company with a villa in France, not putting millions of dollars worth of shares of his company into a blind trust, all while proposing tax changes that would affect other people's finances. So, Andrew, I'm going to start with you on this one. Has the finance minister, with today's announcement that he's going to divest those millions of dollars worth of shares, put them into a blind trust, has he put the fire out? I don't think so. Uh, it's one thing to do it two years after the fact. It's another thing to do it when you should have done it, which is when you first came into office. I mean, the, the villa in France is really only one issue. There's this whole issue of not just that he didn't put the money into a blind trust or divest it as you would normally be required to do, but went to quite elaborate lengths to sort of get around the rules and that, met the letter of the law but not the spirit of it. But much worse, of course, was involved in legislation, C-27, pension legislation that would, uh, a lot of people have argued, would benefit his, his former company, Morneau Chappelle. Uh, you put all those things together, it doesn't look good from a conflict of interest standpoint, and then integrating that with the whole tax reform thing, for the Prime Minister and Mr. Morneau both to be uh, lecturing other people about their use of tax shelters and, and private corporations, while they themselves are, are you know, skilled practitioners, if you will, at this, uh, it's, it has really, I think, done a lot of damage to this government's credibility on this file. What's your sense, Althea? Yeah, I think that um, he's not going to rid himself of the problems uh, that have been plaguing him for the past week. And if anything, you know, today, for example, the opposition attacked on two different fronts, um, the Bahamian offshore accounts and uh, the fact that he may or may not have recused himself from discussion on that very bill that Andrew mentioned, just C-27. Um, I think that people feel like uh, there's a lack of trust with regards to what Mr. Morneau was saying. And so while this is a really big decision to ba basically divest not just himself of his own shares, but his wife's shares and his kids' shares into this family and this company that his family had built. Um, but I think this is a bigger problem about the law. And I think if the Cons the Conservatives and the New Democrats and Liberals all agree that changes to the Conflict of Interest Act should be made, then they're really, they're sh they should be um, really narrowed, because right now it seems like all parties like to criticize when they're in opposition, but in the government they don't really do anything. And uh, there are giant gaping holes in this act that basically uh, allow what is happening with C-27, which is a, a pension um, reform bill that uh, has basically driven the stock up of Morneau Chappelle and possibly made uh, Mr. Morneau close to $2 million just in this short period of time this bill's been tabled, um, that that is totally fine according to the law. What do you think, Paul? Is, is this a conflict of, ish, of, of interest issue? Uh, what's the biggest offense here to you? If this isn't a conflict of interest issue, then I don't know what they look like. This guy mm -hmm. legislated on pensions while he, while he had a clear window into the old pension company that his family ran uh, and, and in which he still had millions of dollars worth of shares. Among the people who falsely thought that his assets were in a blind trust were a member of his own caucus, Adam Vaughn, a Toronto MP, and the public relations department of Morneau Chappelle, which both uh, claimed, which both stated what they took to be the truth, which was that his assets were in a blind trust, and they turned out to be wrong. Um, you know, so the, the, the villa in France is pretty bad, but this is, this is why conflict of interest rules are made up. Uh, it, the, that, that 
you, you, you shouldn't legislate on something in which you have a glaring personal trust. Uh, and if on the off chance that this, that, 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 that this doesn't contravene the rules, um, uh, J Justin Trudeau told his cabinet ministers when they were sworn in in their mandate letters that the that the, that, that the plain uh, text of the, of the of the rules and the law isn't enough. You have to comport yourself in a way as to be beyond all suspicion. Uh, Bill Morneau is up to his neck in suspicion because he did not comport himself uh, so the way that his prime minister it? told him to. It sounds like he's trying to blame the the ethics commissioner. It could be interpreted that is that what's going on? Can he be saved, Paul? What do you, what do you think? Well, apparently she told him that you don't have, like, it's up to you whether it's in a blind trust. Uh, and, and, uh, and he didn't have the sense that God gave a goose uh, to make his own decision that I'm going to put it in a blind trust anyway. Um, it, it's become clear over many, many cases that the office of the, uh, of the uh, Conflict of Interest Commissioner is, 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 is not ideally constructed and maybe needs a second look. But... but Holy cow! Uh, like the week that he, that his government brought in a pension bill that was that that stood to materially uh, improve the financial position of the company with his name on it, in which he had shares, uh, you'd have thought a light would have gone on over his I mean, head. We're back to the Mike Duffy defense. You know, the rules didn't specifically prohibit it. I was told I could do this. Uh, at some point, you got to use common sense. And how is this going to look to the average person? Well, and Althea, this is the government that's presented itself as the champions of, of the middle class, and yet I guess after the, the trip to the Aga Khan's island and so on, it's, uh, people are focusing on them as, on, uh, as riches. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that it would have been perhaps a better uh, strategy for Mr. Morneau to come out and say, listen, we want to uh, stop people using private corporations because they can shelter money away from the tax man, and I'm totally fine, and I think that people should follow my example, and I'm going to be forfeiting X amount of thousands or perhaps millions of dollars in extra taxes because of these changes that I think are the right thing to do. But that is not what we heard. Um, I just... I, I, I don't want to come to the defense to the of Mr. Question. Morneau, but he did say that he, the ethics commissioner went to a, uh, she suggested to him a further step. He says that this ethical shield uh, was designed to prevent him from conflict positions. I don't want it to, I don't want us to leave it like, oh, well, there was a, no blind trust and nothing else was done. He says that he took her advice and they went further than what the law suggested. That's what he says, that her advice to him was right. in order to set the structure okay. up so there would not be a conflict. There's still issues with that. But right. I've got to move on to uh, the next question because we do want to hear from our viewers. This, this one is from Jennifer Yang, who asks, what what has been the Liberals' greatest accomplishment so far? What's been their greatest failure? I don't know. Andrew, is this the greatest failure? What's the uh, <laughs> uh, and what's the greatest accomplishment? Well, I'll start with the accomplishment first. I, you know, they they have several to name. I think the first and perhaps biggest was the reform of child benefits in terms of improving people's lives, particularly at the bottom end of the income spectrum. Uh, they took a number of different programs and rationalized them so they were giving more to people at the lower end and taking uh, giving less to people at the higher end. Uh, it, it's a, a very praiseworthy reform. I think the, they're certainly in a bigger spot of trouble now than they've ever been, but it, the, for a sheer screw-up, I think the whole electoral reform file from start to finish was terribly handled, and worse than that, cynically handled. And what ties this with the, with the Moreau problems and everything else is, you know, people didn't necessarily think that Justin Trudeau was the sharpest knife in the drawer when they elected him, but they thought his heart was in the right place. They thought he had good intentions. They thought he was, you know, more decent, et cetera. And as time goes on, we keep finding more and more spots of cynicism and manipulation and this kind of thing, and that's, I think, toxic to, to this government. What's on your hit list, uh, Althea? I would say the uh, accomplishment is getting along with Donald Trump, which yeah. I think really has taken uh, a very fine set of skills, uh, and I'm not sure a, a, another leader would have been as good at becoming best friends with Donald Trump. Um, Andrew is totally right, electoral reform, where basically the Prime Minister misled Canadians for months. Um, but I would now say, looking at this week, his comments today, for example, um, in Robertval, uh, in the Lac Saint-Jean writing where there's a by-election, where the Prime Minister was under questioning about Bill 62. This is the bill that uh, prevents women who wear the niqab or the burqa from accessing government services, like taking the bus or even going to the library. The Prime Minister hammered the Conservatives and the NDP during the last election on this very issue. He made speeches in which he said that you had to know what a leader's values were 
her and even members of his own caucus. Uh, one member in particular, Alexandra Mendez, said she thought the prime minister, of course, was going to appeal this bill because it was for sure unconstitutional. Well, the prime minister said no such thing at all today. In fact, he said it wasn't the government's role to intervene. And I think that, you know, just to judge Justin Trudeau against, you know, his own advice, this is something that is pretty surprising, that perhaps people don't know who he is and what his values are. Paul, what's your sense? Big uh, failures, big uh, successes? The big success is similar to Althea's, but I might take it a step further. Not only has he uh, stayed in Donald Trump's good uh, graces, to the extent that anyone can, um, they've played a really elaborate defensive game with the United States, uh, activated a, a, a cross-country network of, of uh, pro-Canadian interests, and, uh, and, and really stayed in the game on NAFTA, at the same time as they have begun to really aggressively mow the Americans' lawn economically by, by, by making Canada look like a, a very attractive destination for highly mobile knowledge workers and for uh, big money investors. Uh, so you get Google and Microsoft and, 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 and all these other companies beginning to uh, look at Canada as a very interesting investment destination uh, at the same time as, Amer as the United States becomes a less uh, interesting investment destination. I want to bring in another question now. Uh, obviously, Justin Trudeau wasn't the only one uh, on, the, on the Hill. Andrew Scheer has become uh, the leader of the Conservatives and uh, Jagmeet Singh now. Um, so that's who the race is going to be among in 2019. Richard Raycraft asked, who is Trudeau more concerned about right now, Scheer or Singh, and why? Andrew? Well, I suppose Singh only because the liberal strategy from days of yore is to try to nail down the NDP vote and then and faint to the left and then come back to the center in the course of the election campaign. Uh, uh, if, the, if the NDP can break out from under that, if, if Singh can prove to have popular appeal, particularly appeal as the first visible minority leader, uh, that, uh, that is a danger to them. But of course, the threat to him in terms of replacing him as government is the Conservatives. Althea? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Singh's name is the only one I hear mentioned by Liberals. Um, not only is uh, their strategy to court new Democrat voters, like we saw in the last election, but the electorate with whom Justin Trudeau is particularly popular, Millennials, uh, those voters uh, likely will see, uh, they will find what Jagmeet Singh has to sell appealing. Um, and uh, he could do some serious damage to them in Ontario. I want to get on to one last question. We've only got a minute and a half left, Paul, but I'm going to ask you this one. This is from Mary Connor, who asks, how does the role of Justin Trudeau's PMO compare or contrast with the one we saw when Harper was PM? You wrote a book so, about him. <laughs> what do you so think? I, I, I'm not just being a smart aleck when I say they're eerily similar. Uh, increasingly obvious control from the center on major files, uh, a very robust issues management uh, 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 operation which is designed to put out fires, and increasingly we're seeing that that's a busy branch of this government, uh, and uh, extraordinary uh, message discipline. Uh, every member of caucus, uh, every political staffer is expected to say more or less the same thing on big issues, even if it makes them sound a little repetitive and robotic. We've got maybe 15, 20 seconds left each. What do you, what do you think on this one, Althea? I'm actually surprised at how undisciplined they are. Uh, yes, the message control is certainly there, but the government seems to be going in all types of different directions. And with Mr. Harper, there was definitely a focus. Like every week had a theme and everything was directed in, in that theme and they weren't stepping over each other's shoes with different announcements. So I think that's one thing I've definitely noticed. They're also much more open. I mean, to be fair to them, the Prime Minister does take questions from reporters. Sometimes we didn't really even see questions that this for week, Bill Morneau. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew? Well, they, they even appoint the minister's chiefs of staff for them. Uh, they, their talking points are all written for them. It is every bit as much controlled, if not more so. Well, journalists will always want more transparency. But uh, mm -hmm. thanks very much. It was lovely. We'll uh, see you in two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, guys. Good night. Forty years ago this week, the House of Commons got its close-up. Did the arrival of TV cameras cheapen politics? Viewpoints is next. This is Niagara Falls. And if you've noticed a little more foam at its base lately, perhaps it's mainly because of the beer. Beer that's being dumped by the caseload into the custom shed washroom upriver at Fort Erie. They are bringing more beer than usual on account of the uh, beer strike in Ontario. One Hamilton man who shuffled off to Buffalo to pick up a couple of six packs got his comeuppance. But at least he, unlike many others, was able to kiss his beer goodbye. 
A Canadian beer drinking tradition is disappearing fast, and the first place they're feeling it is in the Maritimes. What's vanishing are those squat and stubby dark brown bottles. The Canadian brewery industry has spent millions of dollars to make the change to long neck bottles, and part of that cost is a result of scenes like this. There's no doubt that Cape Bretoners have done their part to support the brewery industry, and some wonder why the beer couldn't have found its way to a charitable cause. It's a beer drinker's lament. 700 cases of supposedly good brew down the drain, so to speak. Brewers say the change was inevitable. Light beer has become popular, and American beer, and twist-off caps. I find when you're drinking out of it that uh, it foams up more. But most beer drinkers have adjusted. Oh, as long as the beer's still there. Specialty brewers are on the hawk these days, rushing to cash in on more relaxed liquor laws. Now that Canadian liquor laws are changing, new breweries are springing up all over. There's one in the back of this pub in Kingston, Ontario. But the idea of drinking the stuff that's made in the back room is catching on. It's got a hell of a lot more body than Canadian beer, I'll tell you that. It's very smooth, it's very easy to drink. Okay, Ernie, if you could pitch your yeast there. Bernie Knudsen has been coming to this so-called U-Brew store for about three years. It's easy and it's cheap. Making your own beer and wine in British Columbia is virtually tax-free. You can brew a dozen bottles here for about $10. Buying it at the liquor store would cost $15. For the working men, yes, it's the working people, the working class people, it's a way better deal. Most hours have 60 minutes. This hour has seven days. Tonight, Ralph Nader charges the Detroit car companies with running risks that can't hurt them, but do hurt us. I could give an example of the Buick Roadmaster in 1953. The one with power brakes came onto the market, many thousands of them, with a defective braking system. Now, you mean in, in the 53 Buick Roadmaster, with power a driver brakes. would literally go from normal brakes to no brakes like that's that? Right, that's right. This is documented in court records, which is very interesting. It shows you that the only way we find out about these things is through the cumbrous process of the judicial uh, uh, system. So what you want to do is make an overwhelming systematic case to overcome the resistance of industry. The stronger a case you make, the more scientists you have uh, working on the project uh, on an independent, objective basis, the more overpowering the forces of humane automotive technology will be. My name is Don Newman. I was senior parliamentary editor for CBC Television News, and I spent a lot of time watching the House of Commons. Forty years ago this week, TV cameras brought the House of Commons into our living rooms. Some people will tell you that this has cheapened our politics, but I say the opposite is true. It's made our democracy more democratic. Most Canadians have never seen it in person, and their first look at the House of Commons on television back in October 1977 proved quite a shock. Then as now, it was question period that attracted the attention. And then as now, it was no genteel exchange of views. It was and remains a political bear pit where government and opposition members have 45 minutes a day to try and score political points. In fact, question period in the House of Commons is the de facto election campaign when there is no actual election called. And because of television, more rules on how question period operates became necessary. Shorter times to ask questions, less time to answer them. Go too long and the speaker stands up and the microphone of the offending MP is cut off, even if that MP happens to be the prime minister. And the thing that Canadians found the most disconcerting has been canceled. Despite years of tradition, MPs no longer pound their desks with their fist to signal approval of a colleague. Now they just politely applaud. Those changes were brought about to improve the image of Parliament, but what hasn't changed is the critical work the House of Commons does that gradually changes, and hopefully improves, our country. Such as the debate and passing of the bill to patriate the Constitution and include a Charter of Rights in December 1981. 
free trade with the U.S., the Clarity Act, the apology to Indigenous Canadians for the system of residential schools. Because of television in the House, we've had an unobstructed view of it all. And there have been some bizarre moments, too. Who can forget that moment in 1985, when MP Jim Fulton crossed the floor and put a B.C. salmon on Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's desk to draw attention to environmental issues? And poignant moments, like December 2nd, 1994, when Calgary MP Jan Brown placed a yellow rose on the empty desk of Bloc Québécois leader Lucien Bouchard, who had just undergone an emergency operation to amputate his left leg. All in all, television has had a democratizing effect on the commons. No longer are politics the sole preserve of the chattering classes. Not only is the commons on TV, the whole political process is. Since television began in the House, just one federal election campaign has occurred without a televised party leader's debate. Coverage of politics has greatly increased in the media in general, and especially with political programs on television itself. Provincial legislatures have opened their doors to television cameras. Some city and municipal councils have too. Even sessions of the Supreme Court are now televised, providing a learned and genteel counterpart to the feisty political arena. The question has always been, did television change Parliament? The answer, I think, is yes. But it changed it for the better. For The National, I'm Non Newman. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, in the messy world of child protection services, the Mother Risk Lab was supposed to be a pillar of objective reality until a judge ruled their tests unreliable. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Time now for a little ride on the information highway. You might think it's a trip that requires all sorts of complicated electronic gadgetry, but then you might want to think again. Here's Ron Charles with tonight's Canada Online. Music rack. You can talk to it and it will listen to you. It will wake you up in the morning play music, and play the latest multimedia computer programs. I think it's a way in the, uh, to the future, with, especially with the children. This new type of computer marks a turning point for big manufacturers. They now call them home appliances. This computer even has on-screen TV, letting people watch while they work. The big companies are hoping gadgets like this, along with easy-to-use programs, will help them break into the lucrative home market. The home market is the largest growing market, uh, again, because more and more people are embracing computer technology because what it is today, what it was, as opposed to what it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so I see it becoming a very common appliance. Uh, Hello, we're unable to take your call right now. But companies like Packard Bell say their computers will be the answer for people riding the next high-tech wave, the information superhighway offering home services such as shopping, banking, entertainment, even multimedia. But computer companies aren't alone. There's a race on to provide the engine people will use on the information highway. You've got the phone company, you've got the cable company, you've got the television broadcasters, and now you've got the computer manufacturers as well as the software makers. You can scan through the movie in terms of fast forward. Silicon Graphics is convinced its horse will win the race to connect the continent, but not with computers. It's working on something that will be much more familiar to people. They would be compelled to use the information highway on the basis of a, a machine, uh, a box in the living room that is custom designed for that purpose. It's not a computer, it's essentially a hybrid of a TV set with computer internals. But computer makers still think 70% of homes will have computers by the end of the century. And they hope the fancy gadgets in their new machines will help them do a lot of that selling right now. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Rick Mercer Report, Tuesdays at 8 on CBC. This test, I made every answer. C. You made 50 answers C. Probably easier to mark. What I do is I just cover 
the other letters. Mr. D. I look for C's. Takes like a minute a test. Tuesday at 9.30 on CBC. Oh, Tenet, why are you still here? I was gonna watch a movie. What's taking so long? You're doing stretch? Tenet, uh, after a part time is a together time. Don't forget cigarette. Oh. 33 years ago today, a small plane went down in harsh weather, killing six people, including then-Alberta NDP leader Grant Notley, father of Premier Rachel Notley, and a young woman from a remote First Nation. Her death left 14 children without their mother, a devastating loss, but one that galvanized her children to stick together and live meaningful lives. Roberta Bell shares their story. <laughs> this one is Kelly, Wilma. Well, we still have our memories of her. Yeah. <laughs> For years, the Noski siblings haven't been able to talk about their mother. Every time one of them tried, another one would break down. It's hard, very hard stuff. to this day. And so the 14 children Elaine Noski left behind have been suffering in silence for 33 years, unable to deal with their traumatic loss until now. We're finally getting together now just for that to heal, to start healing and start talking about because uh, um, the smaller ones don't know what our mother was like. Elaine had just given birth to her last baby. Premature, he had to stay in the hospital in Edmonton. The 39-year-old mother wrote her 13 other children a letter before she boarded Wapiti Flight 402 to High Prairie so that she could get home to Whitefish Lake First Nation. Because I get home, love, shine, mom. She never made it. A tragic event in northern Alberta last night. Six people were killed in a plane crash near High Prairie. The plane crashed into a forest about 30 kilometers from its destination. Six of the ten people on board were found dead in the wreckage, including Elaine. I cried for a while, screaming into the dark. And um, it seems like after that, things were a little bit blurry for a while. It was a high-profile tragedy. Also killed was NDP leader Grant Notley, a popular provincial politician and the father of current Premier Rachel Notley. Her father's death is something that we rarely hear the Premier talk about. But last year around this time, one of the Noski siblings reached out to the Premier by email, letting her know that they too lost a parent who was supposed to be coming home on that plane. The Premier's response, I am sorry that you too know the pain of losing a parent. There are no words to adequately describe the experience. But the Premier has upheld her father's legacy, following in his footsteps and leading the party that he helped build to form government. With much less pomp and circumstance, the Noskis have, without exception, achieved their mother's dream as well. They've stuck together, all 14 of them. We have a bond that a lot of people I don't think understand. But, you know, that's what my mom brought to us when she was here, but even more so when she left. They all go to school and have education as they grow up. I'm proud of them so much. She would say the same thing too. She would be proud of them. Just because they weren't talking about their mother doesn't mean they weren't carrying out her work. The older ones stepped up to help their father take care of the younger ones, channeling their mother's hard work, resourcefulness and caring. Now Lillian is an addictions worker. So is Debbie. Crystal is an educational assistant, Roger is an artist, and Gareth works in hospitality. Colleen became a teacher. As they raise families of their own, they want their children to know about their grandmother. They want them to understand that so many of the wonderful things in their lives are thanks to her. That even though she's gone, she's not forgotten. Roberta Bell, CBC News, Edmonton. Recapping our top story, the finance minister climbs down from another plank of his tax reform and tries to recover from attacks over his personal wealth. I perhaps naively uh, thought that, you know, in Canada, following the rules and respecting the recommendations of the ethics commissioner, respecting the recommendations of an officer of parliament, would be what Canadians would expect. 
Bill Morneau says he'll go further than the commissioner's recommendations and put all of his assets in a blind trust. And that's The National for this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.